I remember reading a quote that says, I wish you failure so you could better temper success. I wish you sadness so you could better measure joy. And I often say the ability to learn is a gift, even when pain is your teacher. Pain plus reflection equals progress. What's the painful moments in your life, right? What's the reflection that's attached to it? And what's the progress that's gonna come as a result of it? Failure should not become a prison house where you're held hostage the rest of your life by your mistakes. You might be down, but down is not your destiny. Life is full of uncertainty. So if you live this life like you have a whole bunch of second tries and opportunities, you're not gonna get the most out of it. You gotta live each and every single day like tomorrow's not guaranteed because I promise you it's not. Everything starts in the thoughts you think. You are no better than the thoughts you think. If you think little, you go little. If you think weak, you go weak. If you think up, you go up. One thought. Slap yourself in the head. One thought. That's how close you are. I hear so many people talk about the things that they want in life, but not what they're willing to do to get those things. There are not going to be any handouts. You're going to have to sacrifice something in order for you to get everything, everything you deserve. Not what you want, but what you deserve. If you're not willing to put in the time, the effort, and the work, why on earth do you think you deserve anything? I tell you all the time that if you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. I said if you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. If you can see it, if you can get a vision, the Bible says without a vision, people perish. That's why you had to get a new mind. Once you get a new mind, you start building outwardly what you see inwardly. Listen to me. Most people give up when they're tired, but a disciplined person gives up when they're done. Discipline is the bridge between your goals and your outcomes. Either suffer the price of discipline or suffer the price of regret. Inspiration gets you going but it's discipline that keeps you growing. Lay a disciplinary structure on yourself, get the chaos in, in, in check, and then you can move towards a state that's freer. It's discipline first. Like, look, if you're gonna become a concert pianist, there's gonna be several thousand hours of extraordinarily disciplined practice. That's the imposition of order on your potential, let's say. But what comes out of that is a much grander freedom. What is preventing most people from moving in the direction that they want to move is a lack of discipline. And no one wants to hear that answer. It's the harshest answer. It's not cool. It's not good clickbait, right? If you want to make progress in your life, you've got to have discipline. Mm -hmm. That's how you get there. Discipline is the root of all good qualities. It's where there is no vision, the people perish. So the key to your life is finding a vision that imposes discipline on you. Now, one thing I want to straighten out, big time. Discipline is not punishment. It's not. Discipline is training. That's all it is. If you change your mind, your mindset, and really focus it on what discipline really is, you start to welcome discipline. You welcome self-discipline into your life. Big picture thinkers broaden their outlook by striving to learn from every experience. They don't rest on their successes, they learn from them. More importantly, they learn from their failures. They are able to do that because they remain teachable. If you desire to be a big picture thinker, then get out there and try a lot of things. Take a lot of chances and take time to learn after every victory or defeat. When you think about growing, the opportunity for growth, man, is limitless. Every single day, you got all of us in the world that are dealing with a similar situation, but people are responding differently. It's like the quote that says, we all got problems, but what makes us different is how we solve them. Right? Everybody is faced with different situations, but what makes them different is how they solve them. And so for me, man, the greatest thing that's happened as a result of this pandemic is every single day I wake up and I'm intentional about my growth. I'm intentional about it. Don't sell yourself short. Do 
not sell yourself short because I know a lot of times we look for people to blame. We look for excuses as to why we're not where we want to be. But the answer is right there in front of us. Whenever you're in doubt, look yourself in the mirror and have that conversation with yourself. Nine out of ten times, you already know what you have to do. You know what work you have to put in. But are you willing to do it? It's easy to go around thinking that the obstacle is too big. We'll never get well. This virus is going to get the best of us. We wonder why we don't have any strength, why we can't get ahead. It's because our thoughts are limiting us. We draw in what we constantly think about. You can't think defeat and have victory. You can't think weakness and have strength. Your life is going to follow your thoughts. Instead of thinking these weak, defeated, not able to thoughts, you need to think power thoughts. This sickness is no match for me. This virus can't stop my destiny. This trouble at work is not how my story ends. Victory starts in our mind. Success, breakthroughs, new levels depends on our thinking. Be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. Here's the clue. Make rest a necessity, not an objective. The objective of life is not to rest. The objective of life is to act. Think of more disciplines. Think of more ways and means in which to use your own wisdom and your own philosophy and use your own attitude, your own faith, your own courage, your own commitment, your own desires, your own excitement. Invest it, invest it, invest it, invest it in discipline so that it's not wasted. The smallest of disciplines. Thereby transform your life. Join the 5%, join the 10%, join the 3%. If you don't do that, if you get up and you just have no discipline whatsoever, you get no value of anything. Your diets don't work when you don't do them. Exercise doesn't work when you don't do them. But most of the people have, have some experiences that they want to shift. And once you shift those things, your whole life changes. But life is constant growth. My life isn't here because I went to one seminar one time and now my life is fit for life. I, I work out, I train my mind, I train my body. It becomes a lifestyle. I had been working my whole life. And what I didn't understand by being determined to chase something, by being committed to it, and what commitment is, commitment is staying true to what you said you were going to do long after the mood that you have set it in has left. You see, people think commitment is saying, yes, I'll do it on the days when it feel good. But I have been committed to everything that I ever started in my life and I never stopped and I never quit it. And so by being committed to everything that I started, I finished it. It built a certain type of spirit. It built a certain type of mentality. It built a certain type of individual. And so now I couldn't quit even if I wanted to. I couldn't lay in the bed even if I wanted to. I couldn't stop even if I wanted to. I had too much sweat equity in my life and everything that I was doing. I want you to be terrified of sitting on your ass and doing nothing. That is what I want you to be afraid of, of waking up in six days or six weeks or six years or 60 years and being no closer to your goal. You've made no progress. That is the horror. That is the nightmare. That is what you need to be truly afraid of. The masses will use their time being a spectator. We have been conditioned and programmed to be spectators, to watch people live their dreams. You want to use your time living the kind of life that people watch you. You want to use your time perfecting your skill and your passion to stand out as an expert. I'd rather be an overachiever than be average. I'd rather fail than live a mediocre life. I deserve more than that. You deserve more than that. But are you willing to take the steps that it takes to get there? Ask yourself, are you truly hungry? Are you truly passionate about the things you want in life? Because you can get it. You can get it. It's really, really simple. But it won't be easy. And it's not supposed to be. The moment that you commit yourself 
then all unforeseen incidents, people, things that can happen that are positive begin to come your way. And, the, and, the, and the, basically the whole thought was the fact that nothing comes to you until you commit yourself. Change is inevitable. So here's what's going to happen. No matter what's going on in your life, it's not permanent. Everything is going to change. So there's two things you can do with change. You can react to it or you can participate in it. So if you keep waiting around, you're going to have to react to the change. And now you, you're behind. But if you participate in the change, if you know the job you have is not going to last forever. I'm just telling you. COVID proved that already. So what you got to start doing is you got to start anticipating that it's going to change and just start living your life with the preparation for change. No matter what you're doing, you could be doing more. Remember that. It's 24 hours in a day. You got to use as many of those hours to prepare stability for yourself as you can. If you have any dreams of being rich, you cannot sleep eight hours a day. It's only 24 hours in a day. If you sleep eight hours, that's a third of your life. How can you, you cannot be asleep a third of your life and become successful. You can't. You know, we kind of have this idea that if you have a certain delightful, wonderful, positive freedom as a child, and then that's given up as you approach adulthood. But the truth of the matter is, is that you have a lot of potential as a child, but none of that is capable of manifesting itself as freedom before you become disciplined. And discipline is a matter of the imposition of order, and the order is necessary, especially for people who are hopeless and nihilistic. And lots of people are hopeless and nihilistic, way more people than you think. And part of that is because no one's ever really encouraged them. I do think that with, and it's not just in sport, but with, with other things, I do believe that the more you repeat certain things, whether it is writing, working on your, you know, whether it's cursive letters or whatever it is, like when you work on something and you keep doing it over and over, it, it's inevitable that it will get better. And by that, you're creating this feeling of repetition, which leads to discipline. Like, you know you can do it over and over again. I've had in my career probably a total of over 200 pitch meetings to pitch ideas in Hollywood. Out of those 200, they have picked five of them. 200 show ideas, they've picked five of them. But you know what them five was? Hits. In 33 years, five ideas got picked. All I need is five hits. That's all. To be productive, to make an impact, to create a presence. That's why we're here. To work. Work. To, to leave our mark. And so, so do an evaluation of yourself. Ask yourself, if you look at 24 hours, how much time do you spend developing your mind? How much time do you spend learning a new skill the economy has changed 47 million jobs will be lost to artificial intelligence majority of money being made on the planet is being made virtually at home on a computer the game has changed and i'm encouraging you get around people who are using their time productively because people rub off on you when you know your purpose that narrows how you use your time how are you using your time you have something special you have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine if discipline comes from somewhere else it's very, very hard to remain consistent because you tend to resist. It's wild because I see trainers and they're in the gym with people and the guy or girl that they're working out hates their workout, hates it because the discipline is coming from somewhere else. You, it's something that you dread every time you go in, you don't really want to do it. It's like, uh, but oh no, my trainer's here. He's about to, you know, 
beat me up and make me feel crazy. Well, the truth is, every trainer should work his way out of your life. So you can go ahead, do your own workout, do your own thing, practice self-discipline. Resilience is very different than being numb. Resilience means you experience, you feel, you fail, you hurt, but you keep going. When we are hit by a crisis, people that just kind of go numb, which, which basically means that, that I feel nothing, I'm not learning, I, I'm, I'm kind of like not even living, uh, and that makes us a victim. When we go through the crisis, we, we don't go for numbness, we go for resilience, and, and resilience is alive, it is learning. And, and what happens is resilience makes us victorious. It's that resilience and remembering that you put in your heart, you store it in your heart. So the next time you have an obstacle, a, a difficulty, an adversity in your life, that resilience remembers. Don't, don't, don't allow the crisis to numb you. Be alive, learn, feel, fail, learn. That's what it's all about if you want to make this difficult time a good time. Motivation doesn't get anything done. Motivation gets you going. Discipline, commitment, strong habits is what gets things done. Motivation is just a feeling. Grounded action is what gets things done. So here's my invitation to you. The next time you feel motivated, don't do anything grand and exciting or, or, or set any lofty expectations for yourself to like stay that way or whatever the case may be. Get a pad and paper and write down one or two things that you're going to commit to doing every single day, no matter what. You're gonna, you're gonna use that motivation to build a machine for yourself. If the truth be told, we were being totally honest. Most of us don't like waiting. Particularly if we're waiting for something to change or something to get better. Waiting can be a very frustrating experience. But the worst kind of waiting of all is waiting on God. When God forces you to wait for things to get better in your life, for things to improve, to change, to reverse, and nothing is happening. And yet, over and over and over again in the Bible, we're told to wait on the Lord. The most difficult place for you to be in life is in God's waiting room, in God's waiting room. Some of you are in God's waiting room right now. What is God's waiting room? When you're in a hurry for something to happen and God isn't, that's God's waiting room. Some of you are in a hurry to graduate. Some of you are in a hurry to get married. Some of you are in a hurry to start a family. Some of you are in a hurry to launch a new business, to, to, to close a big deal. Some of you are in a hurry for a big goal, a big dream, a big accomplishment. Some of you are in a hurry for all kinds of, of different things, and God isn't. And one reason we get in a hurry is we think we're falling behind. Our friend is getting married. Our coworker got promoted. The neighbors moved into a new house. We got to make things happen. We're being left out. Well, here's the key. What has your name on it will not go to anyone else. We don't like to trust somebody else's timing. Why? Because we lose control. And so we'd rather than trust God because trusting God means, my goodness, I actually have to trust God, 
We'd rather go, listen, I like the plan and purpose you have for my life, but can we do it my way? And here's the funny thing. Now that I'm a parent, I recognize in my children that they don't like it to wait on my timing. They don't like to wait. They don't like to chill and be patient. But the thing is, if they would just trust my timing, they would recognize it's for their good. It's for them to be blessed and prosperous. And so you can live life frustrated, anxious, stressed out, angry, or you can rest and go, God, I have to trust in your timing. Another thing you have to learn in life is that a delay is not a denial. There's a big difference between no and not yet. Now, immature children don't know the difference. You tell a kid, not yet, they start crying and having a hissy fit because they think it means no. They don't understand a delay is not a denial. We all have things that we're waiting for, problem to turn around. When it's taking longer than we thought, it's easy to get discouraged, to become impatient. But sometimes it's not happening because we're not prepared for what God has prepared. You need more time to grow, to develop, to gain experience. Patience is developed in the weight room. Before you see what God promised, God will send you to the weight room. You may not like it. Other people are in the game, making progress. You're stuck waiting. You may not see anything changing, but something is happening. Patience is working. You're growing, developing, getting you prepared so you can sustain what God has coming. Don't get discouraged because it's not happening as fast as you would like. When he knows you're ready, what you give birth to is going to be much bigger than you've imagined. Maybe you've been praying, being your best, but you don't see anything changing. Have a new perspective. You're in the weight room. You're not falling behind. God has you right where he wants you. Now do your part and wait with a good attitude. Thank you that what you promised is on the way. If you will wait with the right attitude, after patience has done its work, you're going to see promises come to pass. Don't allow a moment of agony to make you draw a conclusion about life prematurely. Because if you just keep on walking with God, God has a way of making everything all right. But he warns us that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Now, the term steps implies process. It means it's going to take a while because a blessing given too soon is not a blessing at all. I can give my son the car keys now, but had I given it to him when he was five, it would not have been a blessing at all. He can't handle it. So would I be a good father if I gave him a good thing too soon? Sometimes my goodness is proven by my ability to say not yet. You see, while you're working on your project, your goal, your dream, your vision, God's working on you. And God's much more interested in you than in what you're trying to accomplish. Because you're not taking your accomplishments to he heaven, but you are taking your character. And sometimes God says, yeah, I intend to give you what I've promised you. I intend to answer that prayer. I intend to fulfill the vision, but you're not ready yet. I want you to grow. And when you're ready, then it's gonna happen. And I'll admit, I don't like to wait. I like to make progress. I like to get things done. But I've learned some things take time. So much is developed in the process. When you're doing the right thing, but nothing's changing. Remember, something is happening. 
you're growing. You may not like it, but you can't bypass the process. David said, God, my times are in your hands. I not only trust your ways, but I trust your timing. When I'm ready, when I can handle it, you will take me to new levels of my destiny. Something may have your name on it. You know God has put it in your heart. But if it happens too soon, the blessing will become a burden. Sometimes God proves his love to us by what he's not letting us have. We just have to spend more time in the weight room, growing, learning to trust God, learning to keep a good attitude when things aren't going our way. The sooner we pass these tests, the sooner God will release what belongs to us. You can never lose faith. When you don't see no way how, you have to buckle down and keep believing. God is always coming. The moment you ask God for something, he boxes it up and he ships it to you. It's going to come. He just don't tell you when. But he don't tell you when the package is going to arrive. So here's the deal. He wants you to stay in faith to receive the package. Because he only delivers to Faith Street. That's how it works, man. Let me tell y'all something. Being successful is not a magic trick. You just have to learn the principles of success. I am telling you, your education ain't got nothing to do with it. Now, when you going to ask him for it, and are you going to wait for it to happen? Or are you going to lose faith? Well, I guess it wasn't the Lord's will. How do you know what God's will is? It all happens at an appointed time. But you have to stay in faith for the appointed time to happen for you. Because it's not like you don't have a dream for your life. It's not like you don't have a desire. In fact, some of you, it's not that you don't even have faith in God. Your problem is every time you step out, you have yoked yourself up to people that you have no business being yoked up to, and your life is going in zigzags. Why is it I'm back here again this time like I was last year? I should have overcome that. I should be further. I should be stronger. If you're not committed, you're not going to make it. Your first commitment is to God, the God who gave you life, who blew breath into you. Mama bought you shoes, daddy got you a bicycle, God gave you life. Put God first. Everything that I have is by the grace of God. Understand that. You owe him a level of commitment beyond all others. To commit means to put your body and soul into something, to offer your life as a sacrifice, means that you're willing to make a bargain with fate. And the bargain is, I'm going to act as if, if I give it my all, then the best possible thing will happen because of that. And it has to be an act of faith, because how are you going to know? You can look at other people, but that isn't going to do it. It's, it's a decision. That's the covenant. Right? It's a decision about how to live in the world. Because the evidence can't be there before you make the decision. You know what I thought to myself? I thought I would hate to live and die and never know what would happen if I ever committed myself to anything. Some people have never thrown their whole self at nothing. Not at school, not at work. Oh my God, you've had one foot in and one foot out of every dream all of your life and you've never seen what you could be if you ever really connected and threw everything. And the question is, if you die today, what ideas, what dreams, what abilities, what talents, what gifts will die with you? There's no such thing as try. So most people like to use that language. They don't want to commit themselves because commitment means, among many things, no excuse is acceptable. That's what it means. No excuse that if you decided that you want to do this, if it becomes hard, then do it hard. If it's difficult, so what? If it's inconvenient, so what? See, a lot of people made a commitment to come here tonight, but they looked outside and said, it's rainy. And that's how people do about their dreams. They don't honor their commitment to themselves. Let me tell you what happens when you don't keep your commitment. Number one, it begins to deplete your self-esteem and it erodes your self-image. 
but you've never been the person that you could be because the could be is locked up behind commitment and until you're committed you'll never get the could be you have to be committed through the storm and the rain and the heartache and the pain and the disappointment you have to believe in the we and the us and not the me and the you or you're not gonna make it it's a commitment it's not a feeling What do you do when you tried and failed and you want to quit and you want to give up because trying again means hurting again, means risking again, means believing again, means hoping again. Sometimes you can be blessed and be unhappy. Because even though things are going right, they're not going according to what you had believed and expected. And you know that something is missing out of your life. What do you do when something is missing out of your life and the things that replaced it do not compensate for what you lost? I've always been told how average I can be always been criticized about being average but I want to tell you something I stand here before you not listening to those words but telling myself every single day to shoot for the stars to be the best that I can be good enough isn't good enough if it can be better and better isn't good enough if it can be best turn your wounds into wisdom you will be wounded many times in your life. You'll make mistakes. Some people will call them failures. But I have learned that failure is really God's way of saying, excuse me, you're moving in the wrong direction. Other than death, all failure is psychological. Other than death, all failure is psychological. Think about that. If you aren't dead, then it's just psychological. Does not mean that you won't lose some battles because you will, we all will. But it does mean that as long as you don't surrender, as long as you don't give up, as long as you don't quit, then you haven't failed. It just means you've made a temporary tactical retreat, a brief withdraw so that you can regroup and reattack. If you get beat, unless you're dead, you are not defeated. And you have not failed. What you've done is you've learned. You've gained experience. And you're still alive. So get up and go get after it. We all live in this bubble. What you got to do to get the life that God wants you to have, you got to put more air in your bubble. You got to blow your bubble up. Expand yourself. Take yourself out your comfort zone. Put some more air in your bubble. If you stay in your comfort zone, that's where you will fail. You will fail in your comfort zone. Success is not a comfortable procedure. It is a very uncomfortable thing to attempt. So you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable if you ever want to be successful. People say you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing and it's totally true and the reason is because it's so hard that if you don't any rational person would give up it's really hard and you have to do it over a sustained period of time so if you don't love it if you're not having fun doing it you don't really love it you're gonna give up and that's what happens to most people actually if you really look at, at the ones that ended up you know being successful unquote in the eyes of society and the ones that didn't oftentimes it's the ones that are successful loved what they did so they could persevere you know when it got really tough and the ones that didn't love it quit. So it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of worrying constantly. If you don't love it, you're gonna fail. So you gotta love it, you gotta have passion. If you think ordinary's cool, ain't no problem. It's some really wonderful ordinary people. But if you are sitting in this room and you have extraordinary aspirations, then you're gonna have to do extra. You put extra on top of ordinary and you come up with extraordinary. It's no other way. But here's the fact. All of you have extraordinary capabilities. All of you. 
You have to decide if you are willing to do the things to put you in that category. Rich people don't sleep eight hours a day. That's a third of your life. He who loves to sleep and the folding of hands, poverty will set upon you like a thief in the night. You don't have to live worried, focused on the problems, wondering why it happened. You know a secret, you have favor in the storm. You know what was meant for harm, he's turning to your advantage. Here's the key. The enemy wouldn't be fighting you if you weren't a threat. Oh, get ready. Favor is about to turn things around. Favor is about to catapult you to a new level. Favor is not going to keep you from the storm, but favor will bring you out of the storm. We don't understand everything that happens. Sometimes life is not fair, but you have to trust that God knows what he's doing. This thing called life, you just don't know what the next moment will bring. But here's what I do know, and I want you to know, you have comeback power. When something happens to you, don't buy into what has happened to you. Buy into, I'm getting up out of here. I'm going to change this situation. This does not work for me. And I don't have the luxury of being depressed and angry. I need to clear my head. This is no time to do something stupid, like hurt yourself. No, 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 no. So get serious about your goals, business goals, financial goals, financial independence goals, family goals. I mean, there's so many things to work on on this. If you don't get busy and work on it, sure enough, the time will pass. And sure enough, five years from now, you'll wind up where you don't want to be, wearing what you don't want to wear, driving what you don't want to drive, being what you don't want to be. Now's the time to fix it. Your goals are affecting you, whatever they are. Your goals affect your attitude, personality. All day long, we're being affected by our goals. You got to clear your head so that the decision that you make represents the best in you. People who don't stop to clear their heads, they react. They don't respond. Be still and know that you're going to get through this. You're going to get through this. And you don't want to be radical. You don't want to be erratic. Just be still and know, I'm going to get through this. You got to assure yourself. You have to encourage yourself. You have to clear your mind. Your better future is a dream. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to be? What do you want to see? You've got to dream dreams. Without dreams and visions, people perish. You've got to have something to go for. Take the crumbs from starving soldiers, they won't die. Take the bread from hungry children, they won't cry. But without dreams, we all will die. You've got to dream. Don't lose your dream. Becoming something unique on your journey here, don't lose your dream. That's long-range goals. You've got to have those. Because if you set up something short range, go for it, get it, latch, latch on to it, work hard, accomplish it. That starts building your strong feelings to go for your dreams. Economics plays a major role in everybody's life, which means it ought to be meticulously well planned for tomorrow. The area of life that matters clearly to all of us is time. And most people have very little mastery of this. I don't mean checking things off your list. I mean squeezing out of your life what matters to you most. Your career, where is it now? And where are you financially compared to where you want to be? And especially with some of the changes that have happened in the economies around the world. And then finally, where are you in your level of sense of meaning, of contribution, and your sense of celebration in life? These are the areas that really matter most. Sit down and define what this looks like for you today. And invariably what we find out is almost everybody has some gaps. Gaps between where you are and where you want to be. And even if you've done incredibly well, I mean, I deal with some of the most successful people in the world, they're usually still happy in their life because they're hungry. They haven't lost that drive that says, look, what makes me feel alive is to know I'm growing. You know, if my life's going to get better, I got to get better. I can't just hope it. And if my life is going to be rich emotionally, it's got to be expanding. And they know that. If you work your tail off at work to take care of your family and be the best at what you can do, your career's going really well. Isn't that the nature of human beings? To me, successful is getting to the point where you are absolutely comfortable with yourself. 
it does not matter how many things you have acquired. Uh, the ability to learn to say no and not to feel guilty about it, to me, is about the greatest success I have achieved. Uh, the fact that I have, you know, in the public side, done whatever, it's all a part of a process for growing for me. But to me, to have the, in, the kind of internal strength and internal courage it takes to say, no, I will not let you treat me this way, is what success is all about. I will not be treated this way. I demand only the best for myself. We tend to focus on things we feel confident in, we know what to do in, and the other stuff we kind of hope it all comes together and try not to think about it too much, but it all affects us. You gotta start with what it is you really truly want now. You gotta start with that end in mind. And then once you understand there is a gap between where you are and where you wanna be, here's all we do. We believe that the most powerful way to change anything is total immersion. Listen to me. I don't care how dark it looks for you. I don't care what, what they are saying to you. I don't care what the verdict is. I don't care what the haters say. Prayer changed things. I'm talking to a girl that I grew up on the block, man, that it didn't breed success. A lot of people on our block ain't here no more, man. I grew up in a place, man, that was... That was you had to be something else you come up out of there. Prayer changes things. I was told I would never be nothing. Prayer changes things. I flunked out of school. Prayer changes things. I'm on my third marriage, lost everything I've owned twice. I've been homeless and lived in a car for three years. Prayer changes things. Prayer. The cool thing about prayer is the one thing that's available to everybody at any given time. Do you know that God ain't ever too, he ain't ever too busy for you? You know that God actually knows who you are? Do you know that God actually created you to converse with him? Do you know that God would actually love to hear from you? Do you know that I like talking to him even when I don't really need nothing? So when I do need something, I don't want to have to introduce myself to him. Listen to me, man. Quit playing with this him. You're not going to make it without God. If you've tried it so far, tell me how that's working out for you. It sucked, don't it? You need God. Don't, don't you think I got here without it. I've needed him every step of the way. If it wasn't for God, I wouldn't even be standing here today. I'm telling you right now, you need God. You need to tell him that you need him. Quit being ashamed about it and worry about who looking. Go somewhere by yourself today and tell God you need some help. Tell him that you're just tired of trying to figure it out for yourself. You yeah, already know you got problems. See, God saved me. By God saved me, now listen to me. You ain't got to like the way I'm saying. The right people, divine connections are going to find you. Greater is coming. The enemy thought he was pulling you back to keep you there. He didn't realize, like a bow and arrow, the more he pulls you back, the further God is going to shoot you. He thought he was hindering you. The truth is, he was helping you. The suffering was a setup. God allowed it so he can launch you to a new level of your destiny. Now, don't be discouraged by what you're going through. You couldn't become who you were created to be without the struggle without the disappointment, without the bad break. I know it's uncomfortable. I know you don't like it, but keep reminding yourself, greater is coming. First Samuel chapter 30, David and his 600 men had been out protecting the borders of Israel. When they were returning home three days later, they noticed smoke billowing in the sky. It looked like it was coming from their city. I can imagine they started walking faster, wondering what was going on. When they arrived home, their worst fears came to pass. 
The Amalekites had come in and raided their cities. They burned down all the homes, kidnapped all their wives and children, and took all of their possessions. Here David was out doing the right thing, and the wrong thing happened. It didn't seem fair. But just because you have trouble doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. Sometimes when you're doing right, you will face difficulties. There are forces trying to keep you from your destiny. But when you understand this principle, that every setback is a setup for God to take you further, that the suffering is putting you in position for greater honor, then you won't fall apart when you have a bad break. You won't live bitter because you had an unexpected challenge. You'll stay in faith knowing that the enemy wouldn't be trying to stop you if he didn't know something amazing was in your future. David and his men were very discouraged. They wept until they could not weep anymore. If that wasn't bad enough, David's men were so distraught about losing their wives and children, they talked about stoning David. David could have sat around in self-pity, depressed. Instead, the scripture says, David began to encourage himself in the Lord his God. Maybe that's where he wrote, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. Maybe sitting in those ashes, he wrote, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Instead of complaining, he was thanking God that he was still on the throne. And sometimes you won't be able to find anyone else to encourage you. Your friends are busy. Your pastor's on vacation. Your church is closed because of the virus. You can't find me on television. That's God letting you know you have to encourage yourself. You have to dig down deep and say, I am not going to let this bad break, this disappointment, this injustice steal my joy and sour my life. God, I thank you that you are bigger than this sickness, greater than this depression, more powerful than this opposition. I know you being for me is more than the world being against me. You have to stir up your praise, stir up your faith, start speaking victory over your life. Start thanking God that he's fighting your battles, that this too shall pass, that greater is coming. David prayed and asked if he should go after the enemy. God said in verse 8, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. You may be in a difficult time. You've lost some things, lost your health, lost your joy, lost your dreams. God is saying, if you'll get your fire back and start moving forward, you will surely recover everything that you've lost. The enemy may be laughing now, but you're going to have the last laugh. God has the final say. He saw the injustice. He saw who did you wrong, what you didn't get, what was taken from you. He's saying, get ready. Everything is coming back. Your health your children, your finances, your joy, your dreams, not maybe, not there's a good chance, surely you will recover everything. Surely means without a doubt. You can count on it. God used the word surely not for him, but for us. He's saying, be confident, it's all coming back. David and his men left the camp and headed out. They didn't really know where to go. When it just so happened, they came across a servant of one of the Amalekites. This young man had been sick and not able to travel, so they left him behind. David gave him food and water. He promised that if he would lead them to the Amalekites, he would spare his life. This young man took them right to the enemy's camp. When you get your passion back and go after what belongs to you, God will have the right people in your path to help you. He'll have divine connections, people that will use their experience, their expertise to take you where you couldn't go on your own. Right now, God is arranging things in your favor. He is lining up the breaks you need. He is pushing back forces of darkness. Things are happening that you cannot see. 
If you will keep moving forward in faith, you are going to come in to unusual favor. Breakthroughs, healing, victories, things that you couldn't make happen on your own. David and his men went in and attacked the Amalekites. They wiped them all out. Nobody was left in the camp. Verse 18 says, David got everything back that the Amalekites had taken. They rescued their wives and children. Nothing was missing, small or great, son or daughter. David brought everything back. You may feel like you've lost some things. That loved one that didn't make it. Seems like they took a part of you with them. You don't have the joy you used to have. Or you've struggled with that addiction so long, you've lost the desire to fight. But God is going to do for you what he did for David. One day you're going to say, nothing is missing. I got my dreams back. I got my health back. I got my children back. I got my joy back. God is not going to bring you out partially where you get most of what you lost. God doesn't do things halfway. Nothing is going to be missing. It was a great victory that David got everything back. But God doesn't bring you out the same. When you go through suffering, greater is coming. Verse 20 says, David's men rounded up all the Amalekites' flocks and herds, all their possessions. These belong to them as their reward. There is a reward for going through difficulties with a good attitude. We would be grateful if God just brought us back to where we were. But when you go through challenges in an attitude of faith, with your head held high, knowing that God is fighting your battles, then a reward is coming. You're not going to just come out, you're going to come out better than you were before.